tuning in to the online broadcast network, AfterBuzz TV. Over 20 million weekly downloads in over 150 countries and your number one source for after show entertainment. Johnson. Johnson. TV, the destination for TV superfans, producing after shows for over 300 of your favorite TV shows, interviewing celebrities and showrunners, and bringing you behind the scenes exclusives. All thanks to E Entertainment's Maria Menunos, producer Kevin Undergaro, and internet leader Akamai. Now, let the buzz begin! Hey there, Nick fans. Welcome back to the Nick After Show here on AfterBuzz TV, talking about Season 1, Episode 10, the season finale, Crutchfield. I'm Matt Lieberman. Joining me, as always, the panel is here, Marissa Serafini. Hello, everyone. And Miss Oriana Leo. Hi, guys. Uh, and we have two fantastic guests for you today. Uh, the co-creator, co-writer, co-EP of the show, Michael Begler, is here. Hello. Returning for a second visit. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. And uh, on the phone, we have uh, the fantastic Mr. Andre Holland, who plays Algernon Edwards on the show. Hello, hello. How are y'all doing? We're doing great. Uh, so, so right off the bat, I, I have to compliment uh, both of you on uh, this finale and this season. It's been an incredible ride, and it's a bit, this show is all I can talk about with any of my friends. Anyone who has any taste, I'm like, you need to watch this show. Mm -hmm. This is the one. It's it's uh, the characters are so incredibly rich. The story just keeps moving in all these wonderful directions, and it's it's easily the most cinematic show I've seen in ages. Agreed. And it's it is it is a a, a profound achievement. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I think he echoes your sentiment too, uh, yeah, Michael. Yeah, yeah, I think Andre just said it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's let's get into it a little bit about this finale. What did, what did you two think? Uh, I, I loved how everything just came to a head, and still the story progressed forward, but it still left us with a lot more questions of what's going to happen. And I feel like this was an amazing episode to wrap everything, but start more stories. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. It was so powerful, intense, emotional. Everything was tied up with a bow, but not, um, but done in the exact taste of the show. There was nothing out of place, out of character. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was perfect, but I'm really kind of sad and upset because <laughs> I don't want to, one, stop connecting with these characters every week, and two, I'm worried about them all. Yeah, pretty much I'm everyone. Invested. Pretty much everyone was left on a serious downer, and I feel yeah. like uh, we saw the the natural ends of every one of the major threads that carried through season one. It feels like a very natural stopping point to provide what I think is going to be a very different chapter for mm -hmm. season two. Uh, Andre, I want to talk to you a bit about where Algernon is in this episode. Obviously, he's uh, incredibly heartbroken over the loss of his child with Cornelia. Um, and I was just in, just so, so distressed watching him basically tell her that uh, y your affair was, was a mistake and that she had never really wanted to be with you. I, is it just because, I mean, is it because of the, I assume it's because she aborted your child. I mean, can you speak to what he's going through in this moment? Yeah, well, I think, first of all, thank you for the compliment, man. I'm really glad you guys have enjoyed the show. We certainly enjoyed doing it. Um, you know, for me, one of the, the most wonderful things about Algernon is that, you know, he starts off as this guy who who really comes into a situation not knowing what to expect and manages to hold on to a little sliver of hope that there will be a place for him at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I think that hope is what carries him throughout the first sort of, you know, half to three quarters of the season. And I think that just when he sort of arrives at a place where he feels like, all right, maybe there is room for me here, maybe this thing can work out, the Cornelia storyline starts to develop, you know, and I think that, you know, in that in that finale, him, you know, obviously losing the child and, and then losing her, and I think for him it really is a breaking point where he, you know, realizes or feels, at least in that moment, that actually all this stuff that he's been working for and fighting for has led him to this impossible place where he, where I think he does feel completely distraught and heartbroken and, and doesn't really know where to go from here. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, the place he goes is the place where he's been going, which is, you know, to, to try to, to take it out on someone else and try to express that that the rage and heartbreak that he's feeling. Mm -hmm. And you know, that whole sort of storyline, that arc, that trajectory, you know, Michael and Jack did such a wonderful job of like of really drawing that storyline out. And that for me was one of the most fun parts of this whole season is having 
friends of mine call me and be like, you know, after the show's air and be like, man, what, what's going to happen next with Ozzy now? Why did he do that? What's, you know, what's coming? What's coming? And, and me getting to sit on it and say, you know what? Just keep watching. Just keep watching. You know, and I think, you know, after Friday's episode, I got a lot of phone calls saying, okay, man, now I see why you made us wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's really, really interesting. And something you said just kind of triggered this in my brain of uh, his journey over the course of this season has been someone who he was thrust into this situation that could not be controlled. And he found a place within it uh, to move upward and to get to the place that he wants to be. He's somebody who does not w will not let America's racism hold him back from having the life that he wants and deserves. It's why he built the clinic. It's why, you know, he continued to treat patients the way that he did. And then... Um, uh, to suddenly have that, have those walls start to recede, and ha to be able to live the life that he wants on his own merits, even to win the love of the woman that he deserves, mm -hmm. and then ultimately to realize that he can't keep it is so mm -hmm. devastating. There's a ceiling. Yeah. As mm -hmm. much as he wants to push through that that ceiling, there's no way. I mean, in this time and in this society, there's absolutely no way. And as brilliant and as talented as Algernon is, as as loving as he can be to Cornelia, none of that is going to um, be able to break through this granite that's on top of him, and that's just the white male Protestant society that he lives in. Yeah. It seemed to me like an empty victory. You know, like he got there, but... What does it really mean if he can't, like you said, keep it or continue to progress because that's his nature? Well, there's something interesting that happens here, and, and maybe you both can speak to it. Uh, you know, Andre being on set uh, with Juliet and and Michael in the writing of the scene, um, when uh, Cornelia and uh, and Algernon are speaking, and she says n that the affair wasn't the mistake. Uh, is she saying that she's changed her mind that she would still want to run away with him? She just couldn't run away with a child? Is it, or am I missing something here? I, f I feel like it, on some level her position got reversed. Yeah, what do you think, Michael? What, how do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I have I, I certainly I certainly have my thoughts, but I'm curious to play. Yeah. Well, in 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 here's from from my perspective, and then Andrea obviously jump in, but. Um, you know, the the heart sometimes just can't stop itself. And mm -hmm. I think that for her, it's just we all feel that sense of regret and loss. And, you know, this is the inevitability of her life is that she's going to be married that morning. And but the true love, you know, the passion comes from this man. And I think that she just feels this remorse that knowing that She's she's as stuck as Andre as as, as Algernon is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that she is as trapped as he is. Mm -hmm. You know that she can't. She she wants to live that fantasy too. She wants to believe at the last second that he can sweep her off her feet and they can go to Europe, Liberia. But there's just that crushing reality that she is under the power of her father and of this society, and there's nothing that she can do. And so it's this sort of wistful, wishful hope that this dream can actually happen. But, but even in her heart, she knows that, that, it, that it can't. Hmm. Um, so I want to talk about this, this thread that was weaved through the whole season of Algernon uh, taking out his rage on, on other opponents, mm -hmm. um, getting drunk and beating up other men in the street. And, and we come back to this man who he was very strongly advised against uh, because we know it's a losing battle. Right. Um, uh, Andre, can you talk about when when preparing for these scenes? Like, how crucial is this sort of this need to express this rage through violence to to Algernon? Is it how he's able to contain himself when he's working during the day? Yeah, I, you know I, that 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 part of his character was something that really spoke to me, mm -hmm. and I think you know for me having you know, having grown up in the South myself in Alabama and having seen a fair amount of, of injustice myself and certainly heard about a lot more from my you know, my parents and, and relatives, and, you know, and obviously the history. <laughs> um, uh, it, it really, I understand what that feels like, I believe, mm -hmm. to be caught in a position, to be caught in between two places and not really feel like you have a, a right to call any place your home. Although you've done everything right, you've gone to school, you, you've trained, you've you know, made all the right choices all along the way and still to find yourself somehow on the outside of the thing that you want and deserve. I think that, you know, I identify with what that, that feeling of rage is. And I think that, you know, 
it comes out in different ways for different people. You know, I, Andre, have my own ways of dealing with those feelings. And I think that it's really interesting to me that Algernon chooses to deal with, he chooses to use his hands to express this feeling, mm-hmm. you know? And I think, I think it's about, I think it's about power. I think it's about expressing, you know, his own sort of sense of control over his circumstances by doing, by controlling someone else. Um, I, I think it's about power. I think, and I also think it's like impulsive. I think that there is like a sort of primal part of him that just, you know, when he, when he drinks and when he gets in these situations, I think he just, something, something, in, it awakens something in him that he just has to get out some sort of way, you know? And I don't think that that's something that he's done, spent most of his life doing. I think it's a new thing that he's coming to. And I think, you know, by the end of the season, his choice to go back to the, to the big guy, you know, it was very, obviously very deliberate. And I think he wanted to, he wanted to punish himself, I believe, yeah. for the choices that he's made and for what, you know, what, what those choices have done to, to Cornelia and to his child and to his family and, you know, just all the pain that he's inflicted on others. I think he wanted to feel some of that uh, on himself. Andre, I'm really but curious. Again, yeah. I'm really curious about your boxing stance. I wanted to know. Matt had brought it up earlier in the season about how <laughs> it, it speaks to the fact that Dr. Edwards might have been a professional at some point. I wanted to get your take on that, and if you did any preparation. Yeah, I did. We had a a, a wonderful uh, a couple of fight coordinators, uh, Manny Silverio, and then also I worked a lot with uh, Michael Elijah, who was a former you know champion himself and and you know we really worked a lot on finding that that sort of gentleman stance <laughs> um so that he's, he's not like a he's not really a brawler he's he's more of a sort of studied uh, precise you know fighter and i think it is something that he has some experience in i don't think he was you know a professional fighter by any by any means but i think he you know he definitely learned how to handle himself and it was important to me that the way the fights looked the way that he did that was also sort of reflective of the way that he does his work in the hospital that he's very precise and you know and studied and measured about the way he, the way he did it so I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that and, and appreciated it yeah there's also something very self-destructive about his choice to uh take out this rage using his hands mm-hmm. i mean we even specifically had that moment between him and gallinger when gallinger sucker punches him uh you know several episodes ago in fact tells him you know don't waste your hands a surgeon needs his hands so maybe that also speaks to uh the impulse that you you had talked about earlier uh, uh, <laughs> the impulse that you had talked about er- earlier, Andre. Uh, that it, at that point, there's there's just no there's just no reasoning. It just needs to come out. Yeah, I think that's very I think that's very much what it is. And, and again, like the irony of that, I think is is the, you know Jack and Michael's brilliance. You know, that was their creation, and so. But I think it's absolutely right. It, it is. It just it comes up and it has to come out. And I think that that's just that's the way he expresses himself professionally. And I think that you know for me it makes sense that that's also how he expresses himself you know emotionally. And now it doesn't make sense. It's a terrible, <laughs> terrible choice you know mm-hmm. um, to use his hands to do it. But you know in the moment you know he's a. I think he's a very he's a very sensitive man, and he you know he feels a lot of the world and understands a lot of it. And I think he you know has to get it out somehow. And it's also, it's also riding that line, you know, that, yes, he needs his hands to do the surgery, but it's riding that line of how much pain can I inflict on somebody without inflicting enough on myself mm-hmm. that I can go back the next day and I can use these hands. And I think that it's, a, it's almost a challenge that Algernon puts out to himself, that he'll pick a guy to fight because I think that he knows he can beat the guy. Um, but I think part of it is... How much, how much damage am I going to do to myself that I can, you know, that I can take myself to that point, and yet still be the best I can at that hospital? Um, yeah. And I think it's just a game that that Algernon would play, almost play with himself. I think it's a very, it's very emblematic of his struggle in general. Exactly. Very, yeah. Uh, right. I, I have a question for you, Andre. Um, because we see Algernon, he keeps fighting, and he, at the end of this episode, he, he loses the battle. Now that he's kind of top surgeon, and Thak is kind of recovering, and he's out of the picture right now, do you think Algernon will keep fighting, or is he the kind of character that will throw himself into his work and overcompensate and get over his per- inner demons and his struggles by just, you know, keep doing procedures at the Nick and just really throw himself into the work. Do you think the fighting will continue? 
That's a really, really good question. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> and it's I'm a great question. to find out the answer to that as you are. <laughs> Michael, what do you think? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I think you could go, I think you could go either way, myself. I mean, I, you know, I, look, I think the Cornelius thing is a real breaking point, Algernon, and so you know, I don't know what will happen. I mean, I can, I can certainly see a version of him where he, he does bury himself in his work and, you know, separates himself from you know from the things that he's been he's been close to his family and his, you know but also but i don't know i mean it could go it could go any number of ways i think which is again like you know the brilliance of the writing so why don't you tell us michael what you <laughs> all right let's let me just spill the beans about everything right now um <laughs> please do yeah. uh no, I, I mean, I think it's 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 actually a question that we asked ourselves when figuring out what we wanted to do for season two. I mean, we looked at where we left him and considered it, literally all the things that you were talking about. Like, is it is it worth, is he going to continue down the road, or is it something where he has to now step up and, and take the position that, that he is more than qualified to take? Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, he's always going to come up against the fact that um, he's black. Um, Especially now that the hospital is moving uptown. Mm -hmm. Right, right, which is going to complicate things even more. Mm -hmm. Um, So, Andre, I want to talk a little bit about your your time on the show. I mean, you had so many wonderful scenes this season. What was your favorite thing to shoot? Oh, man, that's tough. Um, I think, you know, I I think my favorite one was probably, and this is like, you know, there's a very, there's a number of them, but... The scene with uh, when Clive's character, when Thackeray discovers the the sub the underground yeah. hospital, that one was one of my favorite ones to shoot because I, when I first read the script and I came to that one, it just was like on the page it was like epic, epic <laughs> showdown. And so, as an actor, I'm, you know, it, it made my mouth water. So that one was that one was, and, and also because you know, Clive's obviously an incredible actor, and so getting a chance to go toe to toe with him was was a treat. But there were so many, like you said, there were so many wonderful things. It really was like. This whole this whole project has just been a, a real gift to me. Absolutely, sure. Andre. I wanted to know what it was like uh, working with Steven Soderbergh and his uh, original way of shooting this series, which has really been remarkable. And not shooting so much coverage and having these single shots where you really have to hold the camera, you know. Um, and we get to see your emotion through so many scenes. What was that like, and how is that different maybe from other projects? Well, you know, in the beginning, what I had heard from other people I know who had worked with him and just, you know, sort of around the way was that everyone said he works really, really fast, so just come in and be prepared, you know. And I and I did, and I was, but but he worked even faster than I thought. <laughs> he, he really, he really, really moves, you know. But at the same time, the thing I find so wonderful about him is that he's really, he's really collaborative, and he... A lot of the decisions that are made about the shots and the way things are going to be, the way things are going to be lit, or the way the story is going to be told, are made in the moment. So, for me, especially coming from a theater background, you know, I, it felt it felt a lot like doing a play in the sense that we would turn up in the morning and we all would come in with our ideas and our sort of sense of what might happen, and then mm-hmm. Stephen would say what you know his sense of what would happen is, and then we all kind of had to just be ready to to go with whatever you know whatever choice he decided to make, and. That's a very like theatrical way of working. You know what I mean? Sort of listening to the audience and and being able to go one way or, or, or another at the drop of a dime. So I think that you know the pace was something that that, that definitely was a sort of shock to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah, the fact that he, he you know that he's helping to he's lighting it, he's shooting it, like literally with the camera on his shoulder shooting it. He, he's editing it. He's you know he's so involved in so many different aspects of the storytelling was unlike any experiences that I've ever had, for sure. But, which, you know, at the beginning was a bit daunting, but by the end, it just, you feel really taken care of because you know that you know, he's got the entire story in his, in his brain, and he's looking out for each and every character's storyline and, and, you know, looking for those little fine details that help bring those stories to life. So it, it really was, a, a, you know, a thrilling and comforting experience as an actor to know that you had that kind of support. Also, that you got to run the whole scenes, you know, like mm-hmm. because Stephen would shoot these single shots. Mm-hmm. These actors really got to play out the whole long, you know. It could be a four-page scene, and they could play it out the whole thing. And I, and I, you know, Andre mentions the scene with him and Clive, and I remember shooting that. Um, and I just remember that they really got to play it out, and so I think that really helps, you know. Correct me if I'm wrong, Andre, but it really helps you as an actor to be able to really 
give the full range of emotion that, that a scene needs. And I think having that freedom was probably amazing. Absolutely, absolutely. And knowing, you know, knowing too that when we will rehearse the scene and we run it all together, you know, what Steven's looking for is what we're doing. You know what I mean? Right. He's not trying to impose his own ideas on what we're doing. He's looking for what we're bringing to it. And then he's, because he's, you know, shooting in, because he's so in charge of all the elements, he's able to sort of adjust what he's doing to, to best capture what it is that we're bringing to the table. So you're right. It is like, it's incredibly liberating to know that you can show up and like, you know, run the entire scene and not have to worry about pulling pieces from here and there and, you know, sort of compartmentalizing your performance. You get to just do the whole, go on the whole ride all at once. It yeah. seems like it takes the acting to a whole other level because the actors mm -hmm. truly get the opportunity to inhabit their characters yeah. to the utmost. And that comes across, in my opinion, absolutely yeah. on camera. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Andre, I just want to thank you so much for joining us on, on the show today. It, it, uh, legitimately, you were a standout this season. You did some remarkable work, and uh, we're, we're so, so happy to have gotten a, the chance to speak with you and to recap this show. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. I'm so glad you guys enjoyed it, and I think, you know, we have a lot to look forward to in season two. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, are, you, are you on Twitter at all? Can the people find you? I'm not as of yet. Okay. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> Baby steps. Right. I'm getting there. Is there uh, anything well, else? Michael is. Michael's All right. on there. Baby. Michael's on it. We'll, we'll get his handle uh, later on in the show. But is there anything else uh, that uh, co that's coming up for you you want people to know about? Uh, well, I did a film this summer called Selma, which is uh, about the civil rights movement, the, specifically about the Voting Rights Act. I play Andrew Young. Uh -huh. And... The film sort of follows Martin Luther King and his band of brothers, as it were. They, you know, fight to get the Voting Rights Act passed and, and enforced. And it comes out Christmas Day, and it's directed by Ava DuVernay, and it stars David Oyelowo and myself and Tom Wilkinson and a, a bunch of other really talented actors. And I think it's something that you know I'd love for people to check out. I think it's going to be pretty special. All right, wonderful. Well, Andre, uh, take care and thank you again. Thank you very much for having me. I'll take care. Absolutely. Bye. Uh, what, what a guy. Yeah. Right. Oh, so happy to have him. Yeah, you have no idea. The best. Okay. The best. Uh, before we move on, I just want to really quickly mention iTunes. Uh, you know, folks, I say it every week, and it's only because it's the truth. The best way to support AfterBuzz TV is to go to iTunes, rate and review the shows that you listen to or that you watch on YouTube. It's how we get our sponsors. They keep our doors open and our lights on. And we, at AfterBuzz, we provide the widest array of after-show content on any platform, anywhere, anytime, in any language. Amazing. It, 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 it really is. And yeah. it's, a, it's a big, big achievement. It takes a lot of people, a lot of moving parts. Uh, you know, the, the way that these, these reviews help us, it makes our shows more visible, makes it easier for people to find them. It's how we get wonderful guests like Michael, like Andre, like all the wonderful guests we've had all season long. So please show your support and go to iTunes. Just takes a minute. Doesn't cost a dime. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So... Dr. John Thackeray. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is, it's so interesting uh, because we saw him go to the absolute depths uh, in this past episode. And you think, on some level, since he has cocaine again, maybe he's coming out of it, maybe he's not as bad. But I feel like now that we've seen through the curtain, it's a, once it's parted, you can't unpart it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the the hysteria that being without the cocaine for so long caused and having to ration it after a fashion in a way that he's never had to, he's really starting to make him crack. Yeah, well, I'll just say that there was a scene that was actually cut out that, that um, sort of shows that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a scene of him and Lucy at his place getting ready to go to work in the morning. And she, she's getting dressed and talking about, you know, they could have breakfast together and mm -hmm. down. And he's shooting up. He's just literally putting on his boots and, and shooting up. But he's also saying, Park Davis has weakened this stuff. It's not as strong now. Oh. Uh, and so he's needing more and more and more. His tolerance is going up and up and up, and he's just needing to feed that. Um, mm -hmm. So that's starting, that, that to us was a, you know, to showcase his, his, his need, his paranoia, mm -hmm. his hysteria, which leads him into um, this sort of competition with Zinberg. With Zinberg. Yeah. I love how, how accurately you portray the sort of devolving junkie. <laughs> just, but it was so true to the story. Mm -hmm. There's so much showing, not telling that right. I appreciate. I have such an appreciation for the show because I feel like it gives the audience the benefit of the doubt yeah. that right. they're intelligent and they can figure it out. Right. But that it showed his 
dev devolution, if you will, as a junkie, but so perfectly because it tied into the competition, it tied into the hospital. Right, and also just how cocaine kind of turned on him in a way because we mm -hmm. see him use it throughout the whole season and he's, he's having all these revelations, but then he thinks he has a revelation and it turns out to be the opposite. Mm -hmm. So it's even turning on him and his use for it. It, it really changed. Right, well, we see in the beginning of episode six, we see the benefits of how cocaine, you know, he, yeah. he, he figures out trivia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then we see that, you know, that, you know, the high is only so high, and then eventually it, you're, you're, you're going to go low, and that's that's what we wanted to show, sort of bookend those two, those two um, events. And eventually the junkie doesn't get high anymore, right? They just are chasing it and are perpetually sick, which is what we end up seeing Right. Here. It's more you just want to stay calm and not feel this euphoria. It's just more about just like to stay uh, even exactly yes. and w one of the other wonderful pieces of this puzzle is how uh, Lucy Elkins has evolved into this enabler mm -hmm. who like this missing scene I love the idea of it because at the end of, of last episode she went to such extreme lengths just to get him back to a level of normal right and then uh, enjoyed and then was just like here use some on me let's let's make this happen right. she thinks on some level okay I got him his cocaine now things can get finally can be normal right. we can work on each other we can make this relationship evolve and it's just not so it will always be a struggle as long as he is on the hook of this thing absolutely I mean she's she's just she, she's the drug buddy without the drug. I mean, mm -hmm. she's just the, she's the enabler. She's the provider. But she, you know, she's a nurse, and she. This is her calling. She feels that she can save people, and mm -hmm. here's the ultimate patient. I can save Thackeray, and uh, as we see, it's mm -hmm. it. It ain't gonna happen. Um, there's even I think there was a in that. In that scene that we cut, there was a, a line about how she has a couple clothes at the house now, mm -hmm. and that so she's feeling this sense of you know uh, domestication, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, and um, and she she longs for that and wants that. But it's such a lost cause because he's so far gone. Right. And it's been yeah. the nature of their relationship since he even knew who she was, mm -hmm. since uh, the first episode, where she was the person supplying him with cocaine when he was, you know, having this attack, injecting it right into him. Uh, and now, even though their romantic relationship has taken off, it, it never changed. The relationship never changed. Just sex is just an added component. And she may see it as romantic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think Thackeray saw it as romantic. Well, it was perfect and painless. Yeah, <laughs> painless how could and she, perfect. How could she right. not think it was romantic? Nothing <laughs> is painless and perfect. Right? right? Nothing. But I will give it to her. Yes, she has been the enabler this whole season, but yes, she is the one that is helping Thack at the end of everything. Mm -hmm. True. And it's good enough that like, her character is good enough to stop when she needed to to help Thack in the position that he's in. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that she is kind of being that savior that we kind of wanted from her all along. Well, there's a lot of growth. I yeah. mean, she's mm -hmm. been through so much. And, you know, this the small town West Virginia girl has has come to the big city and, man, did she get an education. But but she does sort of redeem herself by showing the growth of her and, and the strength of her. You know, it, and you you... You compare that to Cornelia, who is under the power of the men, and the last shot we see of her is going off with Philip, mm -hmm. and she's powerless. And yet here is here is Lucy, who is saving the man mm -hmm. and doing the yeah. thing that's right, and and it shows that there's a strength in her. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a and 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 where those two started, where Cornelia started, and where Lucy started, were, were complete opposites. Absolutely, right. I agree. Uh, another piece of this puzzle is Birdie, um, who, <sighs> damn, mm, poor Birdie, so heartbroken when he sees really what's going on on the double level of finding out that uh, Thack's cocaine use is in fact true, mm -hmm. uh, and that Lucy has had this relationship with him this whole time, and how painful it must have been for him to have to bring his father into this situation with the woman that he told him that uh, he's in love with, and that he's going, you know, the whole reason he's staying at the Nick, and to have his father faux father figure who he had defended so many countless times mm -hmm. disgraced in front of his father. Um, Which is like classic junkie situation. Yeah. Of, I've been defending you. You know, like you think you have this relationship they've been lying to you the whole time and all of a sudden you can tell it's kind of the nail in the coffin for him. Like he doesn't have to do anything. That scene was remarkable. Oh, when yeah. it, yeah. Com it comes out in one line. Yes. Mm -hmm. When he says I don't have to do anything. Michael just, is just oh, yeah. spot on. It, 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 was, it was brilliant. It was a brilliant choice to just scream it out because I in my head I never heard it screamed I heard it more just 
like this seething rage. But yeah, to, to just I mean, and and in a way, it also shows he's still the little boy. Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's his. It's one hundred percent his youth. He had this life in mind, this life that he'd been building with these people that he loved and trusted. This naivete. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That his father had been telling him he had this whole time, and basically, it's just it's everything that his father has ever said. Every weight that he had shoved off suddenly thrust back onto his shoulders as he realizes, I am a fool and a child, and Mm -hmm. I I never should have trusted any of these people. And it's that coming of age story of, you know, you can't be told. You have to learn on your own. Mm -hmm. But boy, do you feel like an idiot when it's true. And we don't want it to be true. Yeah, even the conflict of his character, because we see all these past episodes, he's like, I want to do everything with that. Everything I'm doing, all my work is by this man. He's like, I'm going to stick with him. And then to throw that line out, like, he's not, no... I mean, that that just shows, like, yes, his naivete. Mm-hmm. And when you see him in the uh, carriage taking Thackeray to, uh, uh, to the uh, hospital, and Thackeray saying, like, I was so close, and just that the way Bertie snaps the at tone. him, but he's just like, yes. what? What did you just say? You know, mm-hmm. because he's he's never spoken to Thackeray that way, mm-hmm. and but it, he is he has nothing left in him. Yeah, it's indica- indicative that he has lost all respect for the man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, and it may mean that he's on his way to work with Doctor Zinberg, uh, who I know. Can, can we talk about Doctor Zinberg yes. for a second? Because he's somebody who. We're not entirely sure what his motives are, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, pre- if he's completely genuine, mm-hmm. right? Exact. So I want to I want to go around the table and 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 we'll we'll end with Michael after I give my take. But um, what do we think? Is is Zinberg actually on the level? Does he have any interest in collaborating? Is he just trying to get these things discovered, or is he trying to further his own career and maybe he's hit a wall? I I think that because we know he's a competitive kind of person he and he's laying all of his research in front of this naive doctor who will take anything for anything to advance medicine and i think it's his way to this like yes i have someone I, who i can easily weasel in and help me in this mm-hmm. and to gain the upper hand against that mm-hmm. i i agree i mean i think that he does want to be collaborative but it's for his own ends yeah. i mean all of these doctors are after fame and fortune in some way. Um, they want to be the ones that are inventing everything. Um, I think that you know Matt and I we talked a little bit about it where I I felt like he had a smug smile, a very small smug smile. Wow, alliteration. When uh, Dr. Thackeray loses it after washing up from the surgical theater, um, saying, no, absolutely not. There's not a newcomer coming in here. Mm -hmm. And he has that sense of satisfaction knowing that putting out this collaborative idea was going to piss him off. It was strategic. I think it's all strategic. And even Chickering Sr. approves of Zimberg as well, and he doesn't approve of Thack. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting, and I, I, I like all of your points. Uh, the way the way I see it, we have to remember the blood type research is exactly what he refused to share with Thackeray uh, at the society meeting a couple episodes ago, and uh, I I honestly think that the only reason he is offering to collaborate is because he's hit this wall mm-hmm. and he doesn't know if he's able to finish it and he's just trying he's just trying to get his name out there in any way possible even if it means having to share it with Thackeray I think that he's better at playing the game than Thackeray is I don't mm-hmm. even think Thackeray doesn't even realize there's a game Thackeray isn't aware that there is a game he's just trying to make he's just trying to make this research happen and have this guy this this smug Jewish doctor mm-hmm. uh, come in and charm the crowd while he's in the middle of a cocaine fit, barely able to, able to get through his presentation. Uh, this guy charms the crowd and is is purely about winning over people and is invading in the same way that I imagine Gallinger felt Edwards was invading yep. at the top of the season. Yep. He mm-hmm. has a worthy foe, someone who is as talented, if not more talented, who should not have the opportunities that he has and is better at the game than he is, and he's in no way equipped to handle it right now, and because he's so deep in this cocaine fiend madness, he sees threats where there are none. And this is a guy who, while he is absolutely a competitor in the field, he is not actively trying to ruin Thackeray's career. Thackeray is projecting this on him because of the paranoia of his supply running out. Right. Mm -hmm. I I think you're... Very, very close. Okay. <laughs> Give but, us the missing pieces. Well, no, what I, what, here's the thing you also have to know about Zinberg, or keep in mind. He's the clean version of Thackeray. Mm-hmm. He's yeah. as driven, he's as good, um, at, but 
he doesn't have the coke. He doesn't need drugs. He doesn't need the drugs. Mm -hmm. He so in a way that puts him one up. Mm -hmm. You know, Thackeray, we say, does the cocaine to push forward because you know he's got this body count behind him. He's, they've they've lost so many patients. It's what killed Christensen ultimately. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that Thackeray cokes up so much is that so he can keep moving forward and not have to look back. But Zinberg doesn't need that. Zinberg's lost just as many patients as Thackeray, probably. And Zinberg is, is able to do all of these things. But yes, he's hit a wall, but he's also competitive. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I, nothing, what, what I love about Zinberg is, is that you don't quite know. No. You never quite know what his motive is. And I think that that's something that we, we like to keep sort of to ourselves mm -hmm. because. I mean, we know where it's going, and we know what Zimberg's going to do. But I think it's that he is—he's out for the—he's out for himself ultimately, mm -hmm. like all these guys are. Um, is it—is it safe to assume that Dr. Zimberg will be back in season two? Uh, I can say, uh, yeah, Zimberg. We'll, we'll see Zimberg again. Okay. It's not the end of his story. All right, good, because we're just getting started. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there, there's there's other characters. I mean, I I could say, oh, yeah, they're they're they're, they're going to show up too. Because it is actually kind of left open-ended. If the Nick moves uptown, mm -hmm. that could potentially cost several of these characters their jobs. I mean, we, we, we have no firm we have no firm confirmation that Dr. Edwards will be, get to practice medicine at this new Knickerbocker uh, in uptown. Right. No, you, yeah. we, we, you don't. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know, uh, you know, so, and is, is Cornelia going to be gone mm -hmm. um, you know she is, she is she going to go back to San Francisco mm -hmm. that's open-ended um, how are they gonna build this thing right. you know and you know you can see the the, the wheels turning in Barrow's head mm -hmm. but does that also mean that that Cleary is gonna be out of a job which right. they spoke about yeah right um, and well, that's fine he's got a brand new automobile probably <laughs> <laughs> these Sears catalogs are just mm -hmm. incredible uh, or he got the repeating rifle mm -hmm. um, right um, or is you know is is uh, Thackeray even going to be able to come back? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, are they going to want him back? I mean, they, when they when they when they close it, it's because he's gone, and they know he's he's a junkie, and uh, you've and they say the only person left here with a scalpel is quote unquote a Negro, and it's like so, who's going to be back? In that hospital, in that new, in that new hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, it's also it's going to take a while to build this place. It's not, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. Sure. So, right. um, so uh, unfortunately, we we don't have a ton of time. So I want to keep pressing, uh, and we'll, we'll circle back to Thack and Zimberg if we have time. But I want to talk about Mr. Barrow, who uh, finds a creative solution <laughs> to his problems uh, after getting uh, one hell of a blue bonnet um, <laughs> at the hands of Bunky Collier and his flunkies. Mm -hmm. uh, um, he he literally he made a deal with the devil. He like he went from the frying pan into the fire here, uh, and I loved this scene. First of all, the scene where where he asked Thack uh, to get Wu to kill Bunky Collier, and just Clive's just sheer laughter at the at the preposterous nature of this request, and that he shoots up right in front of him. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, highly indicative of what yep. the hell is going on. Yep, doesn't even care anymore. No, nope. nope, it's out in the open. Doesn't matter. Where's the next one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone knows. Yeah, everyone knows. Uh, so we have this great scene uh, between between Barrow and Ping Wu, where he's like, "So Thackeray sent you this?" <laughs> and he's like, "Yes," and he is he is in danger. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you can tell the whole time, it's like he's not buying any of this. Yeah. The fact that he goes to do it. I mean, now that he has the book and that he he knows like all of these various debtors that he can now uh, you know charge and take over this business. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how aware he was. I feel like w at the moment that Barrow says he's like over ten thousand dollars in debt, he's like he's deeply, deeply. In well, actually, no, he didn't say ten thousand to Wu. He, he said, said ten to Thackeray. To Thackeray. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> That's I guess his he, first admission, though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and actually, th there's a there was a second half of that scene, mm -hmm. which um, you called it. I totally and said he thought it got. I was short. like, there's no way that it just ends there. It's yeah. Thackeray clues in mm -hmm. and says, "You've been you've been getting rich on the back of this hospital mm -hmm. uh, while we've been struggling," and he he pins. Uh, uh, barrow to the wall. Oh wow! And he gets. Yeah. I mean, he takes that coke and he uses it. Um, and uh, and 
I wish we could have seen it. Yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, I, th I think it was a it was it was a good edit, but but that was what you know. So so Thackeray knew mm -hmm. by the end this is this is this is where where Barrow is, and he's like, there's no way I'm going to um, give you any sort of introduction. It isn't simply that you're bargaining with the devil. It's that um, you you have just deceived us and and destroyed us. Um, so, um, but then with with Ping Wu. Ping Wu, I think, is a little smarter than than <laughs> than 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 Barrow wants to give him credit for. You know, mm -hmm. I think that that's the thing about Barrow is that he thinks he's the smartest person in the room. He thinks he's he has the best ideas, and that he should be of a certain class and status, and that he can talk to people and talk down to people. And I don't think he realizes what he gets himself into. It's the reason he lost his tooth. It's the reason he's now in, in the hot water that he's in. I don't know about you guys, but I felt a little sense of satisfaction when uh, Wu was reading from the book. I'm just kind of like, this is what you did to yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'm glad that you're in even more trouble. I know, but just like, there's no way Ping Wu is going to stand for any right. of his garbage. Nope. And it makes me question how smart was Ping Wu from the beginning? Because we. At first, I think the audience believed that he was just a junkie and uh, holding this business and, you know, being the owner of this drug business. But also, like, knowing that when he was fighting and killing Kali and all those men, it seemed like he was very sober. So how calculated and smart was he from the beginning? Well, I don't think that he's necessarily an addict. I think he yeah. uses uh, when he friend. chooses to. But I think fostering a relationship, a dependent relationship with a top-flight New York surgeon, mm. I think he's very intelligent. Highly strategic. Yeah. 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 You know, and, like, get, like, don't give him too much. Don't let him think that he has it easy. Don't let him think that he has one over on you. You know, continue to needle him, Don't but also, him. but also keep his bowl full and his arms, you know, filled with a lovely woman. And this is the same struggle that we see these other characters that people don't take them seriously because they're an immigrant or the color of their skin or their gender. Right. You know, mm -hmm. here's just another his come up and comes. Yeah, I can't believe that he got that that axe in Collier's face before he fired. I'm like, there's no way. I'm like, Ping's dead. <laughs> It yeah. was like a banshee well, moment. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was. It, it, it <laughs> was that contracted if, uh, via Cinemax? Like, there's got to be at least one action scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about uh, the, with Ping Wu is he's he's based on gangsters, real Chinese gangsters that we read about, and mm -hmm. there was one who did wear chainmail when he would go out. And so when he opens up his jacket and you see the chainmail, that was real. And the guy did carry a hatchet. But what he also did because we originally wrote the scene that it took place outside. Um, this real gangster, he would carry a revolver and he would get down on a knee and he would start going in a circle and just start shooting around in a circle anybody around him. Wow. Um, so this guy was a total badass and that's why we wanted Ping Wu to have that. You know, you see him so basically one level calm the entire time until this mm -hmm. final bit. Yeah. And he says, it's a line that's cut with Barrow. He says, um, and I must tell you, I'm, I'm not as forgiving as as Mr. Collier. Mm -hmm. And that that's that was the original line where we left it. Yeah. Well, we kind of already had gotten yeah. that impression yeah. from, you know, if someone had accrued that much debt, I think I it was I would have fed them to the pigs. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, another uh, relationship we get to see kind of not not necessarily reach a new point, but like had kind of off camera developed into something very very warm and sweet is is between Harry and Cleary. Mm -hmm. Uh mm -hmm. the fact that she calls him Tom when she tells him to leave the room, I think speaks so many volumes mm -hmm. to how close they've become, which is wonderful because <laughs> nobody else gets a happy ending. Right, they right. get some money, or at least Cleary gets some money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and she has a new friend. Uh, granted, she may still be going to hell, but that's uh, besides the right. point. And the fact that they're still performing all these operations on someone who's now really close to them, they actually know on a personal level that mm -hmm. like they can keep their friendship intact. Mm -hmm. Um, performing on Cornelia. And I love this qu the quiet sadness of the two of them realizing their mm -hmm. situation, mm -hmm. uh, who will be performing the surgery, who will it be performed on, and that neither of them could have said anything. Right. Could have helped each other no matter how close they are. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you can you talk about writing that scene and sort of that relationship? Well, it, it, it was just that. It's just that here again, two women mm -hmm. who have to, you know, even though she's a nun, they're still living under this the, this society, and there's so so little that they can reveal about themselves. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Cornelia is pregnant is one level, but that she's pregnant by Algernon is a totally different level. And the only person that she could ever talk to about it really would be 
Sister Harriet, but as Sister Harriet, but even she felt that she couldn't tell her that. She couldn't bring it to her. Mm -hmm. And how could Harriet tell anybody what she did? I mean, she she's you know as much as she's a nun and she's doing what she thinks is for the greater good. She's still an employee of the Mm -hmm. hospital. Exactly. And Cornelia is still in in essence her boss. Mm -hmm. So if she says like, oh yeah, by the way, I've been you know hanging out with Cleary. We've been doing these abortions. (laughs) I hope that's okay. Yeah, it's 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 off hours. You know. Yeah, you're still in first position. Right. (laughs) But but I think that they have. I think there's a there's such a respect for one another and mm-hmm. what each are trying to do unspoken mm-hmm. that when they do have that moment and when she does say like I'll get you through this little daughter I mean I think it's 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 that heartfelt that they really feel this this bond of you know being these women in this world mm. beautiful uh, I want to talk about uh, Dr. Gallinger and his wife Eleanor and Dr. Cotton, who oh is just my God. new most hated person on the face of the planet. Uh, this these scenes in the in the mental institution just so like fire under my skin, Heart rage at, at at what has befallen Eleanor, and that no one will care. No one cares. This is it, it is it is a method. This pulling out the teeth is a method that not only doesn't work, it has never worked. No one else is doing it. There is no proof. And he's just like, well, when my proof comes in, everybody's going to be real sorry they weren't pulling teeth out of people's heads. And it's just... And not just teeth. Uh, not That's where they yet. start. Yeah. Well, it's funny because uh, the actress who plays Eleanor is also on uh, Boardwalk, Boardwalk Empire yes. this season, and they had a similar plot line. With, with Dr. Cotton, yeah. We, yeah. we found that out. I mean, we were glad that ours kind of aired a little before, but... Mm-hmm. Um, we we had no, I had no idea nobody had any idea that that was was coming from them and I don't think they knew that we were doing it either, <laughs> um, but uh, it, yeah I, Cotton came from one of our first meetings with Dr Burns we heard about him mm-hmm. and we were just like this is way too good we have to we have to incorporate this so based on an actual historical figure oh yeah Dr Cotton is a real oh, wow. was a real mm-hmm. doctor he he really believed this and it was an accepted. Uh, sort of uh, process and procedure for a number of years, um, and he he really believed that it the point the point of infection was where madness came from. So a lot of things come through the teeth, and then it, but it could be your tonsils, it could be your colon. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So hopefully Eleanor won't be losing any more of her organs. Right, and it's just sad that this is another situation that kind of shows. A lot of people are trying to make advancements in the medicine in like a very extreme lines, but it's just another situation that Gallinger would be resistant to change in medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we only have a few more minutes. Uh, I want to talk about Cornelia's wedding and her future with Philip, uh, which just terrifies the hell out of me. Just even just seeing his face again after several episodes where he was off camera, where I feel like our whole idea of who he was changed mm-hmm. as soon as we understood Hobart's intentions. We hadn't seen Philip since. And whatever he looked like before, whatever impression we had before, now he just looks sour and he looks like pain. Well, and mm-hmm. after the brother kind of saying, like, I don't know what he was thinking, yes, you're Henry. obviously going to be depressed and despondent if you go to San Francisco. Like, I can't imagine you going there. Mm-hmm. It makes it seem like it's a much more evident issue and that her husband just doesn't care. And and you know? that's the thing. Henry even gives her the out. He's yep. like, you can still back out of this. You you're a Robertson. Mm-hmm. These things can happen. Mm-hmm. We have the money. It's not it's not a big deal. Uh but I, maybe it's just because of the heartbreak via Algernon that she f- seems so, sort of resigned to her fate, which is such a sad place for someone like Cornelia to be, someone who someone is who took so down resilient. Mary Mallon, yeah. physically. Yeah. That's the same woman. It's, mm-hmm. it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking, but it's unfortunately, it was the reality. Mm-hmm. I mean, as far as she can get, there's only so far mm-hmm. she can go. Mm-hmm. And, and I think no matter what, even her, you know, her brother can say, like, yeah, you don't have to do it, but she's still under the thumb of her father, and now she's under uh, uh, Hobart. Oh, God. Mm. I hope not actually under no. Hobart. Yeah. <laughs> the, the look on her face when she finds out the earrings are from him is just, it says everything. Mm-hmm. Ashes in her mouth, the words. Yeah, um, yeah. so I, the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up, just because I know you guys are huge uh, you know, medicine nerds, mm-hmm. is, is the blood types thing, the, mm-hmm. the discovery of blood types. I'd never thought about when it had occurred or mm-hmm. what the process must have been, but it seems like you guys had a ball looking into all the different possible theories. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, well, what it was is that we, it was just a lot of research in our old medical textbooks mm -hmm. of what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. The different ideas that they were coming up with that never materialized. You know, this is before Carl Steiner figured it out. They were just all these different kind of theories that they had and and it was sort of like cherry picking and and because we wanted Thackeray to seem like he has no idea what he's talking about mm -hmm. and he's just spinning and spinning and spinning so he's refuted by Algernon when he walks into the surgery like in the middle of the surgery he's like uh, okay I think it's this thing and then when he's talking to Bertie I mean it's just it's purely it's it's pure insanity because if you really read it and really understand it, you, you could see that he is, not, not, none of what he's talking about makes sense. I mean, there's, he's right about certain things, but he's so far off base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I feel like we have to kind of wrap things up. I think it's time to go to predictions. <laughs> yeah. And now, how do you feel about that, Michael? Some predictions. <laughs> I want to. I really want to hear what your okay, predictions are. Okay. Cool. Uh, so yeah, folks, uh, we we are left at the end of the first season of the Nick uh, with Doctor Thackeray uh, being uh, under the assumed name of Crutchfield uh, in this hospital, being uh, dosed up with co with uh, heroin to get rid of his cocaine addiction, face no. palm. Um, <laughs> you know, Nurse Elkins now potentially uh, moving up uptown with the Nick. Birdie potentially moving on with Dr. Zinberg. Gallinger uh, upset with everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Edwards bloody in the street. What do we think is happening? Where are we going next season? Oh, goodness. I think everyone's going to temporarily separate. And they're, they're going to go their own ways, like you just mentioned. But I think once they move to a new location, they're going to realize they need their staff back. And they're going to bring everyone's going to eventually come back together to be the the team that works at the Nick and advanced medicine and that has to get clean. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see he might, I mean, we kind of alluded that he might have another drug addiction problem to heroin now, but I hope that's not the case because we had the whole season one with one drug and I feel like to have another season focusing on another drug would just be a kind of redundant thing. So I think that will get better and he will bring his team that he knows and loves working with to advance the Nick. I say my predictions knowing that I'm sure they're wrong. Um, I, I already know that next season is going to hold so many surprises for us. Uh, but I do think there's going to be an all-new Nick without Dr. Thackeray, or perhaps it becomes a teaching hospital and he is relegated to teaching because no one's going to trust him with a knife anymore. Right. Um, and I think Zinberg's going to play a new role, whether he becomes the new chief of surgery at the Nick uptown. Um, but regardless, that's going to cause you know a lot of friction with all. I can't even pretend to know what would happen with Algernon, but I really hope, Michael, that we get to find out about what happened in Nicaragua, mm -hmm. and that might be the way that Dr. Thackeray gets to stay, because he still hasn't gotten his favor repaid. Interesting. <laughs> well, he did, though. He did when when he bailed him out of jail. He yes. said that that was that was. But the, it's just this ongoing thing between okay. the two of them that I hope it gets revealed. I, I hope it gets revealed too. It's interesting because with the with the, the hospital moving uptown, you know, uh, Zimberg is uh, is the obvious choice f to lead the hospital. Everyone is impressed with him right now. He's the darling of the medical world, but he is still a Jewish doctor. I do mm -hmm. think that he could play the game well enough mm -hmm. to secure that position and keep it, but. I feel like that also pushes out Dr. Edwards because an uptown hospital with, led by a Jew and an African American? Never. Impossible. No. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually excited by the prospect of Dr. Thackeray being hooked on heroin uh, instead of cocaine. It's an entirely different animal drug-wise. And this is a guy who, it, once an addict, not necessarily always an addict, but I feel like getting clean is not... Uh, he's not getting clean. It's, yeah. He's not getting clean, <laughs> exactly. He is, never, he, he is not getting clean, so how is he going to be clean when we meet him again. I think that it's a longer process uh, than we ever could have imagined. Um, oh, what else? I had something <laughs> else. Uh, I guess it'll have to wait for next season. Yeah. Folks, I want to thank you so much for joining us all season long. It's been a real, real pleasure recapping this show for you. Michael, thank you so much for coming well, on I the show. I appreciate the show so much and how much you guys are enthusiastic about the show. Wonderful. Um, where can the people find you online? Uh, they can find me at, at Michael Begler on okay. Twitter. 
And uh, you guys are, you just finished the 10 scripts. We have written all 10, and uh, we start production in the beginning of February. All right, wonderful. Uh, Oriana Leo, where can the people find you? Hi, people. You can find me on Twitter at Miss Oriana Leo or Instagram at Oriana Leo. And check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash the Oriana Leo. You can see my vlogs and running errands in Hollywood. And I am also co hosting the American Horror Story After Show, which airs Wednesday nights at 9. Okay, and uh, Marissa Surfing? Everyone can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Serafini TV. All right. And folks, and you can find me on uh, on Twitter is the place where you can find me at Matt Lieberman, M A T T L I E B E R M A N. You can also find me on YouTube on SourceFed and SourceFed Nerd. Uh, we do every Friday. We do a superhero show wrap up. So if you watch any of the comic book shows on TV, that's the place for you to go. You can also check out my YouTube channel, YouTube.com/slash Matthew D Lieberman. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next season. Good night. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff. We would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.